Let's forget about the Beatles and um, go back to Cold Dark Matter. And um, so, in my last lecture yesterday, um, or in the last two lectures, I've been developing the uh, standard Cold Dark Matter model in which uh, large-scale structure forms from quantum fluctuations uh, during inflation through the process of gravitational instability. And the question I was asking yesterday is how do we test uh, this model, or any other model, but this one in particular, uh, at the present day? The microwave background radiation provides the perfect test uh, and has spectacularly validated this model at high redshift when fluctuations are small. The universe in which we live has large fluctuations, and it's not obvious that um, we can uh, immediately accept that this model is a good description of the contemporary universe. As I argued yesterday, if we were able to have dark matter glasses and um, look at the dark matter, then the test would be quite straightforward because uh, in this model at least, the dark matter uh, evolves purely by gravity and we can make calculations of the nonlinear evolution uh, with high precision. Sadly, we're not yet able to measure reliably uh, the properties, the distribution of the dark matter. So in order to be able to test the theory, we need an extra step Namely, we need to be able to model galaxy formation and find out how galaxies form in each of these halos and what the properties are. And this needs to be done uh, in a quite precise way if we want to do a solid test of the theory. As I argued yesterday, uh, uh, galaxy formation is complex. Uh, and uh, if you naively thought that light would be placed in halos in proportion to the mass of the halo, then you would get completely the wrong answer because the halo mass function, the number of halos is a function of mass, has a very different shape from the observed number of galaxies as a function of luminosity, shown here. And so, as I said yesterday, uh, a theory of galaxy formation can be expressed as a mapping of this function onto that function. And the uh, operator in this case is astrophysics. As I promised yesterday, I'm going to give you a five-minute crash course on galaxy formation in three slides, uh, or three or four slides. Uh, here's the list of processes that you need to take into account if you want to understand how dark matter halos are populated by visible galaxies. Uh, you need to understand how gas cools in halos, how it turns into stars, uh, and how stars produce feedback onto the cooling gas. Uh, how metals which influence the cooling of the gas are produced and mixed, how stars evolve, and uh, how the light is extinted and reddened uh, by uh, dust. Uh, and you need to understand also, since we now know that all galaxies have a supermassive black hole in the center, which seems to play a role in galaxy formation, we need to understand the formation of black holes associated with black holes. Uh, there's uh, active galactic nucleus activity, uh, which we now know must play a role, and I will show you what role it plays in a minute in understanding galaxies. And of course, we need to understand how galaxies merge. As I argued yesterday, some of these processes are beginning to be studied in detail in hydrodynamic simulations, but there's no chance at all that you could uh, run a hydro simulation on a, uh, uh, on a, a simulation like the Millennium. Doing a single galaxy or a handful of galaxies can take months and months of computer time. So uh, that is not a fruitful approach if you want to know how galaxies form in a volume which is large enough that you can actually test the cosmological theory. You want to have a large volume uh, in order to compute things like the power spectrum. And so an alternative uh, strategy has been developed over the last uh, uh, more than 15 years. Uh, depends when you think this process started. Um, which essentially consists of uh, developing a mathematical model of all these processes, which is based either on our understanding of physics or on phenomenological inferences from observations or indeed from simulations. So for example, the cooling of gas is treated by assuming spherical symmetry. And then you have a spherically symmetric distribution of gas using uh, standard atomic physics. We know how much gas cools and on what time scale it cools. It's more complicated. Some of these other processes are a bit more complicated. Uh, but one can build something called a semi-analytical model in which all these physics are parameterized 
uh, in some fashion and uh, essentially using conservation laws, uh, you can write a set of differential equations, couple differential equations uh, with parameters that you then solve, and that gives you a model of galaxy formation. So that uh, goes by the name of semi-analytic galaxy formation. There's a vast literature uh, in this subject, and um, I'm not going to say anything more about it, but um, if you want to learn more about it, uh, I think there are two papers that I should highlight, uh, which I meant to write down here, but I didn't. Uh, one um, that Simon White and I wrote in 1991, which lays down the basic framework, and then there's a quite pedagogical paper by Cole et al., uh, Sean Cole et al. in 2000, which goes through each process in detail, explaining how uh, uh, these semi-analytic models are implemented. Now, in fact, in the Millennium Simulation, uh, two models have, uh, semi-analytic models have been actually implemented and are publicly available. Uh, one uh, from the uh, MPA uh, group and the other one uh, from the ICC in Durham. You can just go to the Millennium webpage and download catalogs of galaxies whose properties have been calculated in the way I just described. So what does that, so how does this work? Well, you go to the Millennium Simulation, you find the dark matter halos, uh, and then uh, some uh, uh, Champing Wu, uh, for example, Champing Wu, no, uh, <laughs> uh, as uh, Chong, Pai Me, Ma, <laughs> Chong Pai Ma explained in the last, um, uh, in the different lectures, you construct halo merger trees uh, uh, from the simulation, you follow the formation of each halo, and it, along each branch of those trees that she showed, you calculate the semi-analytical model, you find out how much gas would cool, how many stars would form, and so on, and you follow the entire formation history of each galaxy. And the outcome, then, is uh, a, uh, a distribution of galaxies in the Millennium Simulation, which is shown here. So these are now galaxies calculated in this fashion. Uh, and you can see, that, in fact, the color of the galaxy here, you cannot see them very well, but the color is actually a real astronomical, potentially measurable color. And you can see, if you compare the dark matter distribution to the galaxy distribution, that uh, not surprisingly, they look very similar because the galaxies form in the halos that trace the cosmic web. If you actually look very closely, you do find that, uh, in fact, they're not identical. Uh, they're interesting bi biases. Um, particularly on small scales. But for example, you can see the voids here uh, are much emptier in galaxies uh, than they are in dark matter. If you look there, that's in the dark matter. Uh, that's in the galaxies. The voids are a little bit emptier uh, than the dark matter uh, at the luminosity shown for the kind of galaxies of the brightness shown in this picture. So, so in the dark matter voids, there are zero galaxies? Uh, that's a uh, quantitative question. Depends what you mean by void. Uh, there are, uh, if they're halos, they tend to be galaxies, uh, but they could be very faint. So we would uh, need to discuss this later. Exactly, you have to refine your question. Um, all right, now, so uh, the conundrum that I uh, presented is uh, solved in this uh, uh, kind of approach. Here are the predictions there for the luminosity function uh, in this, one of these semi-analytic models. And uh, you can see that uh, it agrees very well with the data. Now, that's not a great success of the model. Uh, obviously, that's what one is trying to achieve uh, in this analytic modeling. But it is based on true physical inputs. Uh, and um, one can identify what sort of physics are required in order to account for the galaxy luminosity function. And it turns out that the main processes that are important uh, are different on small scales and on large scales. On small scales, supernova feedback, uh, essentially the uh, injection of energy into gas through supernovae, and uh, 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 another form of feedback associated with the reionization of the universe at early times, these two processes suppress the formation of galaxies in small halos. And that's why there are far fewer dwarf galaxies than there are small mass halos, because galaxy formation is suppressed uh, by these feedback effects on uh, small mass halos. On large mass, halos, large mass halos, there's a, a different form of feedback that also makes galaxy formation inefficient. It suppresses the cooling of gas. And that actually turns out to be, although it's still not generally totally accepted, but it's quite likely that the black hole forming in the center of the galaxy is, in fact, responsible uh, through the active galactic nucleus uh, injection of energy, is responsible for suppressing the cooling of gas and, uh, uh, and uh, making 
uh, uh, galaxies, uh, suppressing the formation of galaxies here at the uh, large halo mass end. So if you ask me to summarize galaxy formation in one plot, I will show you this plot, uh, which is an important one, and I'll come to that one later. So what's plotted here is uh, what astronomers call the mass to light ratio. That's the halo mass uh, divided by the light that managed to make its way into a given halo uh, of mass m as a function of halo mass. So you can read this as the uh, efficiency of galaxy formation going down. So uh, the larger the mass to light ratio, uh, the less efficient galaxy formation is. Uh, the smaller the mass to light ratio, the more efficient galaxy formation is. And theory predicts a curve that looks like that uh, for the reasons that I just described. Uh, here on small mass halos uh, below the mass of the Milky Way halo, galaxy formation is inefficient uh, due to supernova feedback and photoionization. That's why it's not very efficient here. And here, it's not very efficient, actually, for two reasons. One is the AGN feedback that I just mentioned, uh, but also because the cooling time of gas here is long because uh, these objects are very massive, but uh, uh, the gas is very diffuse, and so uh, the cooling times are long. And so galaxy formation is inefficient here, it's inefficient there, and perhaps not surprisingly, it's most efficient on, uh, in, on scales, on, uh, in halos, with the mass scale typical of the Milky Way. So this is where galaxy formation is most efficient. Um, and um, I will come back in a minute and tell you how we can actually test this with surveys, with large structure surveys. What's the accretion rate to the warm matter into the black? What's what? What's the accretion rate to the warm matter into the... No, the dark matter is not accreted onto the black hole. So the black hole accretes uh, gas and then it um, then uh, produces an active galactic nucleus. So, um, uh, the processes by which uh, energy is extracted from the black holes to the accretion of gas are still uh, somewhat uncertain, but it has to do with um, energy being emitted from an accretion disk as gas with angular momentum falls into a black hole. But dark matter is not accreted, it's just gas. Why? Hmm? Why is not well, uh, the, the density of uh, some, some dark matter would, uh, so the, the black hole does produce a compression of the dark matter around it, and uh, no doubt some mass falls into the black hole, but the, the density of dark matter is very low. And so this is not, um, I mean, that's an interesting question, but it's not important for galaxy formation. Okay, so um, how do we, how do we uh, test then, how do we use a, um, uh, a, a galaxy survey um, to test the cold dark matter model? And um, I'm going to then show you how one can use observations to test three key ingredients of the lambda CDM paradigm. Firstly, uh, to test whether the fluctuations that we see in the microwave background are uh, the same kind of fluctuations that we see in the universe today, in the universe of galaxies, uh, by computing the power spectrum of the galaxy distribution, and how that in fact tells us uh, not only about the origin of fluctuations, but also about the nature of the dark matter, and about the values of the cosmological parameters. Then I'm going to tell you how we can use surveys to actually test this key assumption that uh, structure grew by gravitational instability, by the process of uh, uh, fluctuations uh, growing through gravity, expanding, and eventually recollapsing. We can actually test this quite directly. And then I'll tell you a little bit about how we can test these ideas of hierarchical galaxy formation through the, uh, using this data. So first, just a beauty contest. Uh, here are three slices from uh, three famous surveys. Uh, the 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey that I've been talking about, uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and the old survey from, 19, from the 1980s uh, with only a handful of thousands, well, a few thousand galaxies, the CFA uh, survey. So these are three uh, uh, slices to three real surveys of the real universe. And these are slices taken out of the Millennium Simulation, populated with galaxies uh, that uh, were chosen uh, to have the same geometry uh, as, the as the corresponding uh, slice from the real data. So for example, this one has the same geometry as the 2DF. And you can see just by eye that they look very similar. This one we chose to have the same geometry and selection function as the, as the CFA survey. And we chose something with a structure that resembled it. 
uh, and likewise for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And you can see, or just by eye, that these models are very successful. So now let's try to analyze this quantitatively in a minute. Yet another beauty contest. Uh, I used to give a prize for um, when I used to talk uh, smaller audiences for who could tell me which one was the real 2DF survey and which was the simulation. But after a while, uh, um, I decided it was proving too expensive. So I don't give a prize anymore. But um, can anybody tell me which one you think is the uh, real universe? Uh, put your hand up if you think this is the real universe. Uh, only two people, Simon, you should know. <laughs> Vladimir knows. He scared me talk before. Uh, that one is the real one, and the other one is the simulated universe. He got it right. OK, so you can see just by eye, they look very similar. However, there's more, than, of course, as you see in a minute, more than just a beauty contest. One of the lessons we've learned from uh, many years of doing galaxy redshift surveys is that unless you have a model that you can use to interpret the data, you can get the wrong answer very easily. And this goes back, in some sense, to the systematics that um, Eric Glinder was talking about before. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So this is the power spectrum of the galaxy distribution in the 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey. Uh, we worked very hard for 10 years to get these points, about uh, a point every six months. And, um, and here it is. It doesn't look particularly spectacular. Uh, it does look a bit like, uh, if you remember my first lecture, li the linear theory called that matter power spectrum, if you remember, it looks like that. Of course, you, so that's encouraging, at least it, it has the right shape. Obviously, these two things are very different. This is the linear theory matter power spectrum at redshift 1,000 or so in real space. This is the galaxy power spectrum at redshift zero, more or less, in redshift space, because, of course, we don't measure distances in surveys, we measure redshifts. And uh, uh, the redshift is an approximate uh, measure of distance, but not an exact measure of distance. Moreover, uh, this power spectrum is convolved with the window function of the survey. So uh, what we see then here, what we measure that we're trying to compare with this, then is the galaxy power spectrum in redshift space convolved with the survey window uh, and uh, includes nonlinear effects because the universe just happens to be nonlinear. So if you want to interpret this data, you need the simulations. Uh, and uh, they're absolutely crucial, because now you can go to a simulation and view it in redshift space, apply the same selection function, uh, and uh, the nonlinearity is automatically included. And that's what allows you to interpret the observations. So here is the simulated 2DF, the predicted power spectrum, for that particular experiment, which you can compare with the data. And you can see the agreement is pretty good. So now here's the same plot. Uh, uh, just a bit more quantitatively. Uh, it's exactly the same data, but whereas I made the previous plot, Sean Cole made this one, and I used k cubed, uh, Sean didn't. So it's the same data, except this one goes down, the other one went up, because I multiplied by k cubed, uh, whereas uh, Sean Cole didn't do that, but it's exactly the same data. And here you can see very clearly how important it is uh, uh, to uh, uh, incorporate in your analysis, window functions, uh, and so on, uh, if you just took the lambda CDM model willy-nilly, it would predict the blue line. Uh, it's only when you convolve with a window and build in redshift space and so on that you actually get agreement with the data. So if you didn't do that, you would conclude that the 2DF survey did not agree with the lambda CDM model, but that would be an incorrect conclusion uh, due to uh, an inaccurate uh, data analysis, ignoring the systematic effects that Eric was mentioning earlier on. When you do that, you see that the agreement is really pretty spectacular. So the overall shape and amplitude of the 2DF galaxy uh, redshift uh, power spectrum is extremely well fit by uh, a CDM model convolved with the window function. The same is true about the Sloan power spectrum. Once you take into account systematic uh, differences, for example, between the two surveys, uh, I'm focusing on the 2DF because I was part of the 2DF, so I have the plots. Uh, but uh, similar conclusions arise from Sloan. Now, in fact, if you just take the Sloan power spectrum uh, and compare it to the 2DF power spectrum, they completely disagree. The reason is that uh, there are systematics. The uh, 2DF looks at blue galaxies. The Sloan looks at red galaxies. Blue and red galaxies are not distributed in the same way. So if you naively try to compare the two, you get the wrong answer. And some very distinguished uh, colleagues have actually fallen into that trap 
I won't mention the names other than to say that the student of one of them is sitting in this audience. Uh, I won't even look at him. Uh, and uh, it's only when you actually take into account uh, these uh, processes that I'm talking about that you get the correct answer. Now, so if you looked at this, you might say, well, what is this here? Um, it looks a bit weird. All right, now this is one of the most exciting things that's come out of these surveys. Uh, you all know what it is, since we've been talking about it now for a week. Uh, these are the barium acoustic oscillations. Uh, and I'll just remind you that uh, the barium acoustic oscillations are arise from that process I described in my uh, first lecture, the coherent oscillation of the photon baryon fluid in the early universe. And uh, what's oscillating uh, because of uh, the genes mass uh, phenomenon are the photons and the baryons. But although the baryons are only a small uh, component of the gravity, they're only a small fraction of the mass, the gravity is enough that as the baryons oscillate with the photons, they also drag in the dark matter. And the dark matter inherits these uh, uh, oscillations, uh, and, uh, but with much smaller amplitude than the photons uh, do. And so, and in fact, it turns out that the uh, uh, oscillations in the matter are actually exactly 90 degrees out of phase from those in the temperature. But that's exactly the same phenomenon then that we see or that we expect to see with much reduced amplitude in the distribution of dark matter. It's actually the same thing we see in the microwave background. Um, and then the galaxies inherit these oscillations from the dark matter distribution. Should we expect to see this? Um, when I first talked about these binary acoustic oscillations at a Texas symposium in 2004, December 2004, uh, Roger Blanford came up to me at the end of my talk and said, said you know, I knew these oscillations. I, I expected these oscillations to be there. Uh, and uh, I calculated they had to be there. But I went to Martin Rees, who said to me, forget it. They'll never be detected. Should we? Uh, and he never wrote up the paper. Um, now, so that just shows that even great scientists, and they're none greater than Martin Rees, uh, often sometimes get it wrong. Uh, <laughs> now, so the uh, question you want to ask is, should we expect to see these um, oscillations in the 2DF or slowed? How do you know? Well, you go back. Now we have a tool, an extremely powerful tool, to answer that sort of questions. So uh, 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 one can ask uh, of the Millennium Simulation, should these um, oscillations be there? And the answer is yes, but you have to be very careful. So what's plotted here is the power spectrum, not of the real universe now. This is the model universe, the Millennium Simulation, uh, the millennium simulation at different redshifts. 127 all the way to redshift 0. This is now flat, doesn't go up, doesn't go down, because it's been divided by some function. Turns out to be uh, the function that it's been divided by is the linear theory power spectrum in a universe with no baryons. That's just so that you can see the data better. So if you look here at redshift 15, uh, the black line shows the predictions of linear theory. The red is the dark matter. And here, this high redshift, the dark matter pretty much traces the linear theory quite well until you get to relatively small scales of uh, tens of megaparsecs, where you begin to see already at this high redshift nonlinear effects. But the wiggles, as we used to call them uh, then, or oscillations as we call them now, were still there. Now, if you look now at redshift, say, let's look at redshift 3. Now, the green line are the galaxies. There are no galaxies at this high redshift, but at redshift 3, the green lines are now the galaxies. And now you begin to see that these high frequency oscillations in the linear theory are now being erased in the dark matter and even more so in the galaxies. So these fluctuations get erased, these uh, acoustic oscillations are erased by nonlinear effects. Uh, nonlinear effects couple waves of different wavelengths, uh, and then that essentially erases uh, these. Um, erases these wiggles or these oscillations. And so here at redshift 3, and then the galaxies on top of that don't trace the matter exactly. And so the suppression is even stronger in the galaxies than it is in the dark matter. So at redshift 3, you'd still see the first peak, the second peak, uh, the third peak, but distorted, uh, and maybe a hint of the fourth peak. But at redshift 0, for example, the stuff's getting pretty ratty. Uh, and you can see here that uh, you still see the first, second, third peak. Uh, really no information here, but the shape of the peaks has been distorted. And I'm going to come back to that when we ask the question, can we learn about dark energy from looking at these uh, binary acoustic oscillations? So uh, again, so here's now the 2DF. Uh, 
uh, power spectrum, again, divided by some reference function. Uh, and um, a CDM theory would predict the blue line if you ignore the selection, uh, the window function, and so on. Once you convolve with the window and so on, then you see that uh, the theory uh, agrees very well with the data. And it's only this comparison that tells you that we had indeed detected these binary acoustic oscillations in the 2DF power spectrum. And that was very exciting because it directly links the galaxy distribution today to the fluctuations we see in the microwave background radiation and suggests that structure indeed grew by gravitational instability. It's consistent with the idea that it grew uh, by gravitational instability in the lambda CDM universe. Now, at exactly the same time, uh, Sloan also found the same answer, uh, although I should just say for the historical record that we had in fact found the oscillations already four years earlier. I'll show you the discovery data in a minute. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, Eisenstein and colleagues uh, found the same thing at the same time as us. I talked about it in the Texas Symposium, and the Sloan guys were very upset because they were about to issue a press release at the January AAS. They came up to me and said, would you mind not posting your paper on Astro PH? And nice as I am, I said, okay. Uh, and I thought then got beaten up by all my colleagues back in England. But uh, we then issued a joint press release advertising the discovery of these oscillations, even though we really had seen them earlier. But uh, Sloan actually was a completely independent survey. They used an independent, different technique. They didn't look at the power spectrum. They looked at the correlation function. And here is their discovery plot. Now, um, I say actually we already had seen these oscillations in this paper, you know, one. So here are the discovery data of the oscillations four years before those papers. But you can see that where they were anything but convincing. And so in this paper, we just suggested they were there, but we weren't quite certain. Now, so the reason I'm showing you this plot is not just that. It's also uh, to show you how we can begin to exploit uh, this uh, power spectrum and the acoustic oscillations to learn about cosmology. So here's the data. This is from that old paper, but uh, the new data Final data would look like this, a bit better, a bit less noisy. And here are a number of cold dark matter lambda CDM models in which um, some parameters have changed. So let me look at the red line first. So the red line are CDM models with no baryons for different values of this combination of parameters, omega h. So for omega h of 0.1, if there were no baryons, you get this red line. For omega h 0.3, you get that red line. Of course, the universe has baryons. Uh, and, um, uh, and that's what produces the oscillations. And again, you see here uh, how as you change omega h, uh, and, um, and then the uh, curves change. So the shape of the power spectrum depends on omega h. Uh, these blue lines are for uh, big bang nucleosynthesis baryon abundance. Uh, if you change the baryon abundance, these uh, oscillations change, and also the shape of the power spectrum changes. And because we measured it, uh, you can see that we can then learn about omega h and about the fraction of baryons in the universe. Uh, and so that's what uh, we found in our 05 paper, then using the power spectrum, including the binary acoustic oscillations, you can then constrain uh, the combination of omega h and omega b. Uh, and uh, the values we got are given here. And they're entirely consistent with the values that one obtains, say, from WMAP, another microwave background uh, experiment. So this is a completely independent uh, uh, check on these model parameters. And it shows you a first simple application of baryon acoustic oscillations. So uh, the first thing you can learn from them is about the baryon content of the universe. Uh, and if you take into account both the oscillations and the shape of the spectrum, you also learn about omega h. Now, you can also learn uh, about the neutrino content of the universe from the power spectrum of the galaxy distribution. Because uh, as I showed in my first lecture, if in addition to cold dark matter, uh, you, well, uh, what I showed in my first lecture was that the cold dark matter power spectrum has power on all scales. The neutrino power spectrum, hot dark matter, has a cutoff. You can imagine having a mixture of both and a little bit of one, a little bit of the other one, and you'll get something that combines these two. On small scales, all the amplitude would come from the cold dark matter part. On larger scales, from the hot dark matter. Uh, and when you add the two, the shape of the spectrum uh, will obviously vary. And that's shown here. For example, if neutrinos made a contribution to omega of order the contribution that baryons make, we would expect the power spectrum uh, to be like this. So this is the power spectrum for a lambda CDM universe where uh, uh, omega matter is um, total omega matter is about 0.3 or so. Uh, and 5% uh, is neutrinos, 4% is baryons. 
and 20% uh, is cold dark matter, you could get a power spectrum like that. It clearly disagrees with the data. And so you can then use this argument to set a constraint on the neutrino mass. And uh, because uh, that's the power spectrum that changes depending on the contribution of neutrinos to omega, which in turn depends on the mass of the neutrino. And just like in the 1980s, we were able to rule out uh, neutrinos with masses of a few tens of EV. Now, with this much better data that was just based on the CFA survey, we can now set a very strong limit on the uh, sum of neutrino masses to be less than about 1 EV. Uh, this number is a bit old. Um, the Sloan number, uh, they uh, followed our analysis here, and they now have a, a much uh, smaller number, I think it's 0.8 or something. Is this independent of the, of the equation of state of dark energy? Well, this is in the, con yes, this is in the context, context of a lambda CDM model. It's always in the context. So if you change other things, then if they change the shape of the power spectrum, then things would change. So it's not only it's lambda CDM you know, with uh, the simplest lambda CDM model. Because, for example, your inflation could have different effects on the power spectrum, for instance. Uh, and um, that, so it's for a standard model that these uh, uh, constraints apply. OK, now, so you've seen then the uh, power spectrum of the galaxy distribution depends on these parameters that I just mentioned. Also depends on the amplitude, of course. I didn't mention that one. But it's a quantity called sigma 8, uh, which we also constrained here uh, in this paper uh, to be essentially very close to 1. So that's the amplitude of fluctuations in the galaxy distribution, slightly less than 1 on 8 megaparsecs. At any rate, the uh, galaxy power spectrum depends on parameters. The CMB also depends on parameters. It depends on many more. I've listed some here. There could be more, depending on how complex you think inflation is. Uh, and so uh, many of these parameters, as we heard in these lectures, are degenerate. So they're degeneracies between important parameters. For example, if all you have is the CMB data, then there's a well-known geometric degeneracy between the curvature of the universe uh, and omega lambda. So you often see these uh, very strong limits on omega lambda, but that's often because the curvature has been set equal to zero, uh, or then you do get a very strong constraint on lambda, or something else, there's another prior that has been put in. But in principle, there's a degeneracy between omega lambda and omega k if all you have is CMB data. It's a bit old, this plot, but the principle is still, the case is for, I think, WMAP1 data, but this hasn't changed much. When you combine uh, the CMB data with the large-scale structure data, then some of these degeneracies are broken. And uh, you can see now that when you combine the two, then uh, this is very localized. Uh, you get a very good measurement of omega lambda. And uh, that's just because the shape of the power spectrum depends on omega h. Uh, and uh, uh, h gives you a scale. That's what lies behind the breaking of this degeneracy. But the point here is that uh, uh, when you combine microwave background data at rate of 1,000 with a galaxy uh, data at rate of 0, then you and obtain a completely uh, new uh, constraint or measurement detection, if you like, of dark energy or yeah, dark energy, cosmological constant in the context of these models, dark energy. And so this was the first independent verification, independent from the supernova, that we do really indeed have something like dark energy. It's totally independent of supernova. They don't play any role. It's completely separate. Uh, and I think that's at least what convinced me that uh, so I was skeptical about the supernovae, as many people are. But this uh, is quite a um, strong argument. It's not completely watertight. If you really press hard, you can find ways around this. But uh, in a simple interpretation, uh, here is pretty strong evidence for dark energy from uh, combining these data sets. And another thing that uh, was seen through this sort of approach, and is now very old, uh, uh, it's 2006. This object moves fast. Uh, was the detection of a uh, power law index uh, slightly less than 1. So 1 was the harness also lovitch index I was talking about uh, before uh, in the first lecture. And uh, this combination of uh, WMAP1, actually, and 2DF already showed that uh, this index is not 1. And that has only got better uh, as uh, new releases of the WMAP data have come out. So we now know, I think that's an important result, because as I said in the first lecture, if n was exactly equal to 1, you'd rule out inflation. n has to be close to 1, but not exactly equal to 1. And this also raises the exciting possibility that gravity waves might be uh, produced uh, in inflation by the standard model, the standard processes. 
OK, now let me move quickly now to gravitational instability. So what we want to test is the basic formation mechanism for structure, uh, namely that uh, you have small perturbations that they grow, that grow, reach a maximum size, and then recollapse. We want to test that. Now, how would you go about testing that with a galaxy survey? Well, here's how you can do it. And this is an idea that uh, goes back to Nick Kaiser uh, in 1987. So here, here's the mass concentration, say a galaxy cluster sitting here, an observer sitting there. And here's a, a shell of galaxies. Okay? And the observer has a telescope and measures redshift. What would the observer see? Well, when the observer measures a redshift, he or she measures the sum of the Hubble expansion, because uh, the universe is expanding, plus a peculiar velocity due to the gravitational force exerted by this concentration of mass on the galaxy shell. So consider a galaxy here. So this galaxy has a Hubble expansion, but the mass concentration is pulling it down. So it's a redshift would then be smaller than the redshift corresponding to the distance in the absence of this mass concentration. In other words, uh, this galaxy in redshift space will be located not here, but uh, at here, because delta v points in this direction uh, and so subtracts from the Hubble expansion. Likewise, a galaxy here in redshift space will have the sum of the Hubble velocity plus the delta v, which now points in this way. So a galaxy here in redshift space will appear there. So a shell of galaxies in real space becomes a flattened ellipse in redshift space. OK, I hope that's clear, because a lot of the stuff we've been talking about here actually has touched upon this. This is um, a, a basic concept then that in real space, in redshift space, there's a distortion. People talk about redshift space distortions. That's it. That's what the redshift space distortion is. Now, it turns out, so you could actually measure this in the uh, galaxy surveys. And the way to do that is by uh, computing the correlation function, the two-point correlation function, and uh, uh, as a function of two coordinates, sigma and pi, where sigma is the direction perpendicular to the line of sight, where it's perpendicular to the line of sight, and pi is the direction parallel to the line of sight. And so this effect that I just described will show up in contours of these two-dimensional correlation function as ellipses. So if there was no gravitational attraction, then these would be spheres, or if you were able to measure the correlation function in real space rather than in redshift space, uh, these would be symmetric. But this uh, redshift space distortion causes these elongated contours. Now, there's another effect here. If you have a galaxy cluster here, there's another distortion that comes in called the finger of God effect. And that's just because in a galaxy cluster, that's a virialized structure. And so galaxies have random velocities. And these random velocities can be pointing up or down. They're different from this coherent info. Uh, these are random motions in a galaxy cluster, and they just smear out uh, the distribution along the uh, line of sight parallel, the, par the, uh, the direction parallel to the line of sight. So that's the well-known finger of God effect. It occurs here on small scales. Uh, it is this flattening that we're interested in if we want to test gravitational instability. Well, the 2DF was ideal to test this. Uh, and um, in fact, uh, the first 2DF paper was precisely showing this phenomenon uh, in a really exciting way. Uh, in this paper, in 2001, uh, the data for the 2DF are shown here by the color contours. Uh, the, color, the color are the data, uh, and the lines are the model. And, um, and you see here, for the first time, we were able to see clearly with high signal to noise. Other previous surveys had seen hints of this. But for the first time, you could clearly see this um, uh, Kaiser flattening. And uh, this is very exciting because it gives you direct evidence that gravitational instability is operating in the universe today. What this is telling us is that, indeed, uh, gravity pulls and that material is being accreted onto uh, mass concentrations. Uh, that's what this um, distortion actually means. Like many of these physics phenomena, you can also use it in practice. Uh, to compute um, uh, cosmological parameters, because 
the delta v, uh, as uh, Simon said uh, in his lecture, is proportional to delta rho over rho. Uh, and I think Eric also mentioned that the coefficient here is omega to the 0 0.6. Delta rho over rho is the mass uh, uh, density contrast, because that's what produces the gravity. You don't measure the mass, you measure the galaxies. Uh, and mass and galaxies are related by the bias parameter that I already talked about when I was talking about omega equals 1 CDM. I talked about biasing. Uh, the bias is just a, in this simple formulation, a constant that relates fluctuations in the mass to fluctuations in the galaxy. So delta V depends on omega to the 0.6 over B. Uh, and uh, this uh, flattening then allows you to constrain that number and obtain a measurement uh, of that uh, quantity. And um, that's the answer you get for this parameter called beta, omega to the 0.6 over B, is about 0.5. If uh, you think that galaxies are roughly trace the mass, maybe not exactly, but roughly, B would be equal to 1, and you obtain a value of omega, mare, which is exactly uh, in the same sort of ballpark as the values you obtain from other measurements, like the CMB. So well, what do we learn from this? So let me just combine the two measurements from the surveys. We've seen binary acoustic oscillations. They have to do with these um, um, oscillations in the Big Bang. We have evidence for large scale info. But well, that looks a hell of a lot to me like gravity is at work in the way in which we expect it to be in a universe dominated by cold dark matter. This doesn't prove that the dark matter has to exist as such. It doesn't rule out any modified gravity. But it hell of a lot looks pretty good for the view that dark matter actually exists and that what we see really here in action is this process of gravitational instability from small fluctuations, almost certainly, of inflationary origin. OK, now, so let me now spend a couple of minutes telling you about how we can use these surveys to test whether our ideas about galaxy formation make sense at all. And uh, in particular, can we find evidence for uh, this hierarchical galaxy formation uh, and modulated by these feedback effects. So here's the plot that uh, summarizes our understanding of galaxy formation. Simple, this is a plot for physicists. Astronomers would probably hang me if I tell them all of galaxy formation is contained in this plot. But the basic ideas are here. The shape of this curve is really uh, what um, encapsulates the basic physics of galaxy formation. Can we test this with a survey, a galaxy survey, like the 2DF? Uh, what you would need to do in order to carry out a test is two things. One is easy. You need to measure how much light there is in each halo. That's relatively easy, because you see the galaxies. The hard part is to measure the halo mass. That's much harder. But you can try, thanks, you can try and do that. Um, for example, you can. Um, uh, find groups and clusters of galaxies in a survey like the 2DF or Sloan. So I say all this, uh, everything, when I say 2DF, I really should be saying 2DF and Sloan because all this work has been done in the two surveys. And uh, I think, in a sense, although I keep emphasizing the 2DF, so I say that's because those are the slides I have. In many ways, the Sloan is twice as big, and it has a lot more data, so it has superseded the 2DF. But from the point of view of the principles, uh, it doesn't really matter. I'm uh, using this for illustration. This work has been done uh, on the 2DF, but also uh, on Sloan. So uh, what you can do then is find groups in the 2DF uh, survey or the Sloan survey. You, uh, there are algorithms and uh, procedures for finding uh, groups and clusters of galaxies in surveys like this. Uh, for example, in the 2DF, we found about 28,000 groups with, more than, with uh, two or more galaxies. Uh, about 7,000 with four or more galaxies. Once you have a group, there are various estimators of the mass. Uh, and uh, they're uncertain. You can use velocities, kinematics, for example, or you can use other indicators. They're all uncertain. And again, the only way you can make progress is by referring back to the simulations and the mock catalogs and asking in the mock catalog, I want to know, I know in the mock catalog comes from a simulation, I know exactly what the mass of the halo is, so I can ask, Suppose I'm doing, applying some algorithm in the real survey. Would I actually recover the right mass of the halo or not? What do I need to do? How do I optimize uh, the search and so on? So all that work's been done and described in one of these papers, in that one. Um, and, um, and here's the answer then. 
So what's plotted here then is the mass to light ratio. Uh, that's the theoretical curve from before. It turns out that uh, the blue BJ luminosity of these groups is a, a, a very good indicator of the total mass. It's very well correlated with the total mass and tested against mock catalogs. So you can read this really as halo mass uh, with some errors, but uh, roughly as halo mass. So here's what the theory predicts, and here's what we found in the 2DF. And you can see there's a small systematic. Uh, we understand why that is. Uh, but uh, certainly, in principle, the data agree very well with uh, the um, expectation of the theory. But unfortunately, we run out of data just when things get exciting. If you remember, this is the Milky Way halo. And what you really want to see is this part. Now, unfortunately, we don't have data in the 2DF, but um, we have uh, good ideas. Uh, this idea actually goes back to Simon. He doesn't know that, but um, in the 1980s. So what we did here uh, was to, uh, in order to fill, up, fill in this part, uh, we just simply assumed that um, the number density of uh, groups brighter than some luminosity in the 2DF uh, was equal to the number density of dark matter halos in uh, lambda CDM with mass greater than M. So if you make this identification that uh, uh, the halos and the, just the number density of halos and the number density of groups in the 2DF match each other, then you can infer the mass corresponding to a given light, and then you can actually probe in this sort of slightly indirect way, you can probe this end. And so there is a strong suggestion here that uh, our theories of galaxy formation, at least in principle, are sound, and that indeed what um, determines the efficiency of galaxy formation in halos of different mass are these sort of processes that I talked about before. So that's uh, quite reassuring. All right, so that's the third test I wanted to do. Uh, this uh, school is called um, uh, Cosmology for the New Generation. So I just want to spend my last very few minutes uh, uh, talking about large structure for the new generation. And uh, I had to choose what to talk about. And uh, I could have then given you another three lectures on what the future holds with surveys like PANSTARS, for example, which will have new challenges. Because in PANSTARS, we're going to measure billions of galaxies, literally, but without redshifts. So one needs to use uh, uh, something else called photometric redshifts. Uh, and so I could have talked about that, but I chose to focus on baryon acoustic oscillations, how you might use them to constrain dark energy, because it's a hot topic. I think probably too hot for its own good. So as uh, should be abundantly clear by now uh, from the previous lectures, the baryon acoustic oscillations can be used to constrain W. I already use them to constrain boring things like omega matter, and the baryon content of the universe, not boring to me, but boring to others. But now we can actually use them also to measure W and uh, the equation of state parameter. And uh, the idea, I hope it's now understood by everyone, uh, I'll just repeat it though, namely the commuting sound horizon at recombination is given by a formula like this, uh, which does not depend on W, this just depends on physics, depends on the equation of state, depends on the sound speed. Um, and it depends a bit on the expansion rate of the universe, the density. Uh, omega h squared is just the density of matter. Uh, and um, so, but it depends on physics. It doesn't depend on geometry, or it doesn't depend on whether or not there is dark energy. And so that sets a uh, standard ruler. Uh, if you actually measure the uh, baryon acoustic oscillation scale in a galaxy survey at some redshift, then you need to involve the uh, distance redshift relation, for example. Uh, and that involves W. And so if you measure the baryon acoustic oscillation scale and compare it, uh, which depends on W, and you compare it through the um, uh, distance redshift relation and compare it to this physics uh, determined uh, standard ruler, then you obtain an estimate of W. That's the basic idea. I'm sure everybody is familiar with that here. So the first question you might ask is, how well do I need to measure this acoustic scale if I want to constrain W to some accuracy in the case where W here is assumed to be constant, uh, just and not necessarily equal to minus 1. So uh, you could ask the same question for other models, but that's the question we ask here. Uh, this is work by Raul, uh, who was here before. I don't know if he's still here. Is Raul here? No? He's gone uh, somewhere. I don't know where. But uh, anyway, so if I say something wrong, you can blame it on him for not being here. So suppose you want to measure W to an accuracy of 4%, plus or minus 4%, okay, between these red lines, and you're going to do an experiment at redshift 1. <coughs> then you can ask, how well do I need to know the acoustic horizon scale? And this alpha is a stretch parameter that's related to that. 
So you can see that if you want W to say 4%, you need to know alpha to 1%. It's a factor of four. If you say I want to know W to 1%, then you need to know this acoustic scale to 0.2%. OK? Now, bear in mind that picture I show you of the baryon acoustic oscillations in the millennium simulation. You're going to have to extract a number to an accuracy of 0.2% out of data like that. Now, again, you're not going to make any progress in this area, contrary to what some people say. Uh, I nearly mentioned who says this, but I won't unless you have simulations that allow you to control the systematics that Eric emphasized. And we've done some work on that. Again, this is another paper by Raul Angulo. Uh, on, we've done a large simulation, which we call the basic simulation, which stands for baryon acoustic oscillation uh, simulations at the ICC. Anyway, this is simulation which has 20 times the volume of the millennium, uh, but put it resolution and allows us to try and begin to investigate some of these systematics. It's still just very early work, and it just gives you a feel for the sort of systematics you will expect. Now, how much time have I got? Five minutes. Five minutes. OK. So let me just run through these systematics. I, I don't expect you to understand everything I'm going to say. The next few slides are going to go past quite fast. I just want you to get the feeling that there's lots of things you have to worry about. OK? So uh, here's a plot of the power spectrum. Divided, all these plots are divided by the linear theory power spectrum. So in linear theory, this is just a straight line. It's a function of wave vector k. Uh, and this is for dark matter in the basic simulation at various redshifts. And you see here the onset of nonlinearity. I showed a plot like that before. But what's alarming here is that even at redshift 1, there are already, even at redshift 2, there are already deviations from nonlinearity of four to a few percent on alarmingly large scales, this scale of 0.1, scales, uh, the scales of the baryon acoustic oscillations. Now, of course, we don't see dark matter. Uh, moreover, we don't have access to real space. We have access to redshift space. And in redshift space, we have these distortions. So you ask what happens to the dark matter in redshift space, you get the Kaiser info boost on large scales. Uh, and you get the finger of God effect on small scales. This boosts the power. Uh, this suppresses the power. So the power spectrum in redshift space doesn't look anything like the power spectrum in real space, which is what we know well from theory. But of course, we don't see dark matter. We see, perhaps, halos. Well, the halos themselves are biased relative to the dark matter. Uh, and moreover, uh, the halos don't suffer fingers of God effect, because the halos, uh, we're not looking inside the halo. We take the collection of halos. Uh, and the finger of God effect, the halos are not, the super <coughs> clusters are not virilized. So there's no finger of God effect. So there's no suppression here. So what you get is what, in the jargon, we call a scale-dependent biasing in redshift space for halos. Of course, we don't see halos. We see galaxies. <clears throat> the galaxies themselves are seen in redshift space. Uh, and, um, and again, the galaxies in redshift space also have a scale-dependent halo, a scale-dependent bias, which moreover depends on what kind of galaxy you're looking at. So here are predictions for um, what the power spectrum would look like on large scales for different ways of selecting galaxies uh, at different redshifts. Uh, it makes a difference whether you select uh, galaxies by uh, the equivalent width of oxygen 2 line, or you uh, split them into blue and red, and so on and so forth. All these uh, different uh, surveys have different systematics. They give you different results. And so if you want to get an acoustic uh, oscillation scale out of these, you're going to have to understand these things very well. These are our attempts to replicate some uh, ongoing surveys. Uh, you can see how rapid the data are. And uh, let me just summarize this discussion by uh, showing you a slightly pessimistic plot that shows how well we expect to do in measuring W. And this is in a very idealized case. This is for a model where W is just a constant, not necessarily minus 1, and where we've assumed you know every other cosmological parameter perfectly, which is clearly not the case. So what's plotted here is uh, this uh, figure of merit uh, that uh, is used in the subject. Um, uh, being nationalistic as we are here, we define the figure of merit to be 1 for the 2DF uh, survey. And this just shows you how much better than the 2DF you'll do. So for example, Sloan's already done better. Uh, these are current surveys. Uh, and if you want to do a significantly better than the current surveys, uh, uh, we don't think that the next generation of, um, you can read this, but it's, this is pan stars, and this is WFMOS. They're not going to be a big increase. Uh, we're going to have to go to the long term. Uh, mostly through space uh, missions uh, and 
uh, even then, say with uh, Euclid as its known noun. Uh, so, say, so here's the error in W. In a very, it's a very optimistic error in W. So pan stars, for example, uh, might get one down to a few percent uh, using billions of galaxies. Uh, these two, this slightly old slide, these two uh, missions are now joined together, and it's called Euclid. Uh, and here, you might be able to begin to probe down to the 1% scale. But this is not going to happen uh, for 10 or 15 years. So let me summarize then these three lectures. I can summarize them in one slide. Uh, I think uh, what uh, uh, we've been developing, we, the community of astronomers and physicists over the last uh, 25 years, is a very appealing and consistent picture of uh, what has shaped our universe that begins with quantum fluctuations uh, at an epoch of inflation. Uh, and these fluctuations are seen uh, in the microwave background radiation. And we have direct evidence now, as I argue today, that these fluctuations grow to give the galaxy distribution today. Um, now, so the lambda CDM model is intrinsically implausible, probably almost certainly wrong. Uh, and um, uh, uh, it assumes all sorts of weird things, quantum fluctuations, inflation, non-baryonic dark matter, dark energy. I, I would bet it is wrong. Uh, I'd be amazed if it's not wrong. Uh, and Eric argues very convincingly that uh, lambda doesn't make any sense. We'll see. The reality, though, is that as of today, uh, this um, uh, intrinsically plausible model agrees with a staggering amount of data, all the way from the CMB to galaxies. The existence of weirdness uh, in the form of dark energy is actually, I think, well established because we have, as we should always have in physics, two independent measurements. We have the supernovae, which have their warts and their imperfections, but we have uh, this method that I outlined today, which is completely independent, and they give us the same answer. Moreover, the basic cosmological parameters uh, that define this model are now known to very high precision. So what is there left? Uh, oh, sorry. So let me just say, yeah, what is there left for the new generation to worry about? Firstly, um, I've now summarized here the state of the, of the field uh, by plotting in a single graph the microwave background power spectrum that probes the universe from gigaparsec scales to scales of a few tens of uh, megaparsecs at redshift 1,000, linearly extrapolated to redshift zero. And we have now galaxy surveys that probe the structure of the universe from scales of uh, around 100 megaparsecs to about 10 megaparsecs. And you can see that there is a range of scales where the two, agree, the two actually coincide, and they give reassuringly good results. However, this is still 10 megaparsecs. The Milky Way is much smaller than 10 megaparsecs. The comma cluster is of that order. We don't yet know whether the theory is correct here on scales of galaxies and clusters. And this is one of the frontiers of the subject where uh, extremely interesting physics probably lie because I think it'll be by probing this uh, sort of regime that we learn, for example, whether the dark matter is indeed a cold dark matter particle or, or something more complicated. And Simon, in his lectures, spent all his time talking about this little bit. That put him in his right place. Uh, I talked about all this. Simon talked about that. But that, I think, <laughs> is one of the frontiers in the subject, and a very exciting one. Uh, True. <laughs> but that is, anyway. So now, <laughs> I think uh, there's a lot to go for in, on these scales. It's a very exciting frontier. So what are the open questions in dark matter? Well, what is it? Uh, if it's a supersymmetric particle, will the LHC give evidence for it? Will direct or indirect searches find it? We don't know. Is this model really correct on large scales? Obviously, uh, I brushed a lot of sins under the notion that we understand galaxy formation. We don't. Uh, and what the theory really predicts is the dark matter. Uh, and the only way we have to prove this is through gravitational lensing, another area where strong progress is being made. We ideally like to be able to map the growth of the power spectrum at different epochs and really test even more directly. Well, I think we have test quite directly uh, gravitational instability, but even more precisely by measuring uh, the spectrum, the growth of the power spectrum. Uh, we need to improve our understanding of galaxy formation because, after all, that is our main source of information about the universe. Is lambda CDM correct on, on small scales? Again, 
Uh, Simon went through a lot of this. Uh, we haven't talked about uh, some other halo uh, uh, properties that uh, are listed in this slide. But uh, as I just said, we're just beginning to probe theoretically and observationally the regime inside dark matter halos. What about dark energy? Well, I think Eric Lindner almost said, not quite, that nothing is known. That is not really true. We do know something. We know it's there. Something like it is there. Uh, theory, I think, in at least the foreseeable future, is what I think most progress will come. Because I tried to argue with the barium acoustic oscillations that it's a long game. So if you're impatient, don't join a big collaboration. Uh, to work, don't join Euclid, even though we need manpower in Euclid. Don't join GDAM. If you're impatient, go do theory <laughs> or do astronomy. Because these are long, long, uh, it's a long haul. These are long range projects that will take 10 or 15 years to mature. Um, however, there is hope. I think uh, uh, there are ways to measure the fluctuation growth rate and the geometry, which depend on W. And uh, in principle, progress can be made, but I suspect it's going to be slow. So dark energy, what we're going to need is inspiration. And there's no better source of inspiration than these four characters. <laughs> and the famous <laughs> <sort> of help. <laughs> and I finish here. <laughs>